first session of the afternoon. It's uh, Building the Community Enterprise Operating System through CentOS Stream with David Kapaka and Neil Gonka. Hi. Hello, all. So we're here to talk about that. And this is a little bit about who we are. There's lots of bullet points. Um, the important thing is that both of us are very well versed in the community in, in community engagement. I do a lot in Fedora, CentOS, and and KD and other places. And you know, I also do a lot in Fedora, CentOS, and a bunch of other places. Right. Um, I my day job is a production engineer at Meta on the Linux team. And uh, my day job, quote unquote, is uh, I'm a consultant, a principal consultant with Velocity Limitless, which is my own company for doing this stuff. And I'm also a co-host on the Pseudo Show podcast which just put out an episode this week. Oh, cool. All right, let's get started. Um, so um, today we'll be talking a bit about CentOS Stream, uh, what it is, how it came about, why it's interesting. We'll then deep dive into the work the two of us are doing specifically within the Hyperscale SIG, which is one of the many special interest groups within the CentOS project. And then we'll close with a few words on how you two can get involved in the project. So, so let's start talking about CentOS Stream. So when you look at CentOS Stream and how it fits within the ecosystem, all of it really starts from the community projects that are done in the open source space. There's millions of projects doing all kinds of cool things. Then people in the Fedora space, which both of us tend to operate in quite a lot, they, do, they bring the ones that are, look cool, have interesting capabilities, or can otherwise enhance the quality of a Linux user experience uh, and put that all together. Uh, then it comes through a stabilization phase, which we like, which is now term CentOS Stream. And this is where Red Hat plus the community kind of come together to put these things together through its paces to be uh, transformed into something that can be re relied on for the long term. And then the final output is this Red Hat Enterprise Linux product, which takes that stabilized stuff and then adds on additional process requirements, certifications, and things like that, accounts for it as a product that people can rely on for the long haul in specialized environments. Yeah, and in this context, Fedora Linux and CentOS Stream are both open source projects distributions. Uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is a product that Red Hat the company actually sells. So we want to start by talking about where things began with in terms of like this flow. Like we talked about how the flow is at a broad level. This is the more mechanics, the mechanics of how that worked out in the days of yore with CentOS Linux 7, which woohoo, finally finally over and I don't have to deal with it anymore. But it started with <laughs> Fedora Linux 19, uh, sort of. But for all intents and purposes for this discussion, Fedora 19. And then inside of Red Hat, what they will do is that they take Fedora 19 branch or fork or whatever term you'd like to use to create a thingy, technical term here, a thingy that exists inside of Red Hat for the purposes of making the shifts and changes, analyze what they, what's in Fedora versus what they need, and make the adjustments to productize it for their, for their customer base. And that eventually, after some indeterminate amount of time, turns into Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.0, which then, in the, in, after that point, the CentOS community would then look at the sources, take it, strip out all the Red Hat marks, and then make a CentOS thingy called CentOS Linux 7. And then this, of course, continues onward with all the point releases every time a rel 7.1, 2, 3, yep. 4. CentOS would then take the thing and go with that. Oh, next slide. So with eight, things were a little different. So eight started to begin with from Fedora 28, uh, which was a bit more recent. Um, also, eight was the first time when CentOS Stream was introduced. And the idea was that Red Hat would take Fedora 28. It was branched internally still into the stable distri into the staging distribution, this kind of primordial soup. This then evolved into CentOS Stream 8, and this was released to the public as its own distribution. And then Stream 8 was continuously life cycled throughout the lifetime of uh, 8, uh, of the RHEL 8 product. And then from CentOS Stream 8 is where Red Hat would branch the releases for the products they release with RHEL 8, uh, 8 .0, 0, 0, 0.1, and so on. Uh, with 8, we also still had CentOS Linux to make things more confusing. Uh, CentOS Linux was a rebuild taken like in the days of CentOS Linux 7, where CentOS Linux 8 was a rebuild taken from the sources of RHEL 8 without, uh, without going from CentOS Stream directly. Um, so you can see already there's a shift towards having more things that people can actually contribute to directly that are out in the open. Uh, now, with 9, we added another piece to the puzzle. Is everything all right? 
Oh, I think your mic got, OK. We now embed another piece of the puzzle. So we now we started from Fedora 34, a bit more recent again. Oh, um, uh, I, we mentioned before the staging distribution. Now the staging distribution is actually public. And since the start, uh, Fedora 34 uh, flows into Fedora ELN continuously. Fedora ELN, and we talk about ELN in more detail in a bit, uh, is the staging distribution where the, the system is qualified into an, um, an enterprise operating system. From ELN at one point, we branch CentOS 9. CentOS 9 gets stabilized, eventually gets released. And then from CentOS 9, Red Hat releases their products in Red 9.0, 9.1, and so on. Uh, we don't have CentOS Linux anymore, because uh, CentOS Linux at this point is EOL. And the only deliverable that comes out of CentOS, the project, is CentOS Stream 9. Uh, and now here we are with CentOS Stream 10. So all the things that Davida just said about Stream 9 are happening now, again, with Stream 10. Uh, we have not reached the point where there is a rel thingy yet. But we have the CentOS Stream 10, which was branched from Fedora 40 um, back in March-ish. And that came out of the rebuild from Fedora ELN. So they took the ELN artifacts, pulled all the stuff that they cared about, and then went through a build cycle to essentially switch all the branding from Fedora to CentOS and have started you know, stabilizing and integrating all the things that are needed for the next Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, at this point, this is the what some people would call the fast-paced stabilization phase, which is an oxymoron if I've ever heard one. But it is the important place where people like us, or you, can then work with Red Hat to make sure that all their concerns are heard before everything's locked in you know, by early next year. Because you know, we now know that RHEL 10.0 will come out midpoint next year, or some, something like that. And so getting involved now at this point is how you can kind of shape what that looks like in the future. So to recap, Fedora is what ends up influencing the next CentOS 3 major release. Uh, you can do work in Fedora to influence the long-term direction of the industry. Uh, the work you can do in Fedora is just like day-to-day -day work in terms of like filing and fixing bugs on packages. You can maintain packages and add packages to the distribution for software that you care about. And you can drive changes. Uh, changes are the changes or change proposals are the primary way that the Fedora community handles a modification to the distribution. It's how new things are introduced. It's how, in general, processes are modified. And it's how the distribution is governed. Uh, over the years, um, we have worked together on a variety of changes within Fedora. Uh, this is a short and probably not comprehensive list. It is definitely not um, comprehensive. I remember that we did more. <laughs> yeah. But like in 33, for example, we worked on getting ButterFS um, shipped as the default file system for Fedora, um, for um, all editions except server and cloud. Then in Cloud was added then in 35. 30, in 34, we also added the standard compression support for ButterFS, uh, and we shipped system D, UMD. Uh, and then with 36, we started doing stuff, uh, we started doing stuff around making hermetic operating system environments by relocating the RPM DB to user. We started uh, the fallback host name stuff in 37. Um, and Thir then, and yeah, 38 switch frame pointers on by default, uh, which helps uh, with uh, continuous profiling and debuggability in general. Um, and there's still work going on here. We have a couple of changes to where we're making. We've been working for several years on DNF copy on write, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and Michelle, who's sitting somewhere in the back, uh, has been working on firmware minimization as well. Uh, but these are just some examples of the things that we are able to change in Fedora that then eventually flow into the enterprise Someday. OSs. Um, so uh, we talked about how we do things within the main Fedora context and how that can influence the long-term things. But there's also aspects of Fedora where you get to influence the enterprise Linux uh, environments directly. And one of those is through the Extra Packages for Enterprise Linux project, or EPL. And so this provides additional packages for, uh, for the Red Hat ecosystem, enterprise Linux ones, based on Fedora packages that are in the mainline Fedora distribution. And one of the bigger things that we have kind of spearheaded is to have this Apple Packager SIG to streamline the processes for bringing content from Fedora to the enterprise Linux ecosystem uh, in Apple. Um, Michel, again, over in the back, uh, he wrote this wonderful eBranch tool that makes all of our lives easier for actually shipping software quickly. Um, and this is like a big aspect of how, for a lot of people, um, this makes the enterprise Linux platforms, such as CentOS Stream and, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux and so on, uh, useful and, and, and something worth actually being able to build upon. Yep. Uh, next slide. Uh, now let's talk about ELN. Um, ELN is a continuous rebuild of Fedora Rawhide. Rawhide is the, the development distribution of Fedora. So it's where changes land first. 
And ELN is a continuously built up provide with the CentOS macros and toolchain. So it's as if every day we were making a new CentOS thing released based on today's Fedora. And this is really useful because instead of having to do all of the work to bring up a new release at the end, we can just like spread it continuously throughout the lifetime of Fedora. And whenever changes come up, we can immediately assess what the impact is going to be. Um, this work is done by the ELN SIG within Fedora. Uh, SIG is a special interest group. It's one of the governance blocks that the project has. Uh, the SIG mostly focuses on enablement work, on tooling, on infrastructure around keeping ELN working. Um, the SIG also worked on establishing ELN Express, which is a way to get coverage for packages that won't be part of CentOS Payment RL, but will be useful for things like Appel. Um, and the state of Extras right now is kind of in flux. Uh, we've, we've used it and we've got signal on what would be useful um, in the future for future releases. And we expect for Appel 10, for the 10 release cycle, this will be a lot more streamlined to flow changes from Extras into Appel 10. Yeah, a good example of this where the ELN uh, work has actually been very helpful is making sure, you know, one of the most popular things that come out of Apple is um, KDE Plasma. Because KDE Plasma as a desktop and a technology stack is not included in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But lots and lots of people want that. And it is a big stack that can be very complicated to bring into Apple without any early signal to understand what is needed and what is missing. ELN Extras allows us to have a continuously building art of, uh, set of content for the KDE stack to make sure that we have identified what we need to do to bring it into the next Enterprise Linux release and bring it in very quickly. Um, and with my meta hat on, um, Meta runs CentOS Stream on the whole production fleet, so it's like millions of machines running Stream. Uh, but we use ELN to make it easier to do qualification of the next CentOS Stream major release. So we can do continuous testing and integration, and whenever changes land in ELN, we immediately know, is this going to be a problem? And we can start working on it early on, instead of having to scramble at release time to fix all of the things all at once. You mean you don't like doing that? No, I do not, especially not with a small team. <laughs> Um, right, and so this all kind of comes down to now we're talking about the actual CentOS Stream releases, particularly in this case, CentOS Stream 9. As, as we've kind of mentioned before, it's a continuously delivered distribution that is aimed around a particular enterprise Linux release. In this case, for CentOS Stream 9, it's based on, it's the RHEL 9 platform. You can file and fix bugs and stuff like that with the RHEL project on the Red Hat Jira. Um, uh, but you can also follow the development on their public OG instance, which is their build system, as well as tracking what code changes happen in on their GitLab project. Um, change is basically driven in CentOS Stream from the, the top of the layer cake f uh, flowing downward. So if you think of like syrup coming down the, the cake, then that's pretty much the way that it goes. Um, I'm torturing analogies, and it's fine. That's great. Um, but, you, but, the, but more seriously, right? Like So the, the special interest groups that layer on top of the CentOS Stream core are where a lot of the stuff gets prototyped and enabled, and then it can be submitted into CentOS Stream core itself and then integrated in as part of it. And you know you can test out daily composes that are going to be, get pushed out, and they're available on the mirror network, so you have access to all this stuff. And CentOS Stream tends to push out stuff to the mirror network like weekly. Um, and yep. then if you want to have more frequent, if you like to do more, frequently stuff, you can just grab the composers directly and, and do fancy things. Yeah, or if you like having synchronization points instead of a continuously updated mirror. Right. Um, and over the years, again, uh, same with same to what we talked about earlier with Fedora, we had the chance to contribute a number of features to stream. Um, this is another like non-exclusive list of things that- Yeah, it's a short we, list of fancy things. We also forgot to update. Um, oh yeah, but there's a lot you, more. You get an idea of some things uh, around Umdi and around enablement uh, for the graphics stack. Um, and for some user space plumbing. Uh, now talking about 10, uh, 10 already exists. You can install it now on your laptop if you would like. Uh, it is not officially released, but it does exist. It's on the mirrors. It's being actively developed. So if you go on that GitLab, um, you can see that there's branches for the various CentOS releases. So there's C8S, C9S, and C10S. And the C10S branches is where Stream is being developed. Uh, Six can already target Stream 10. And in fact, a number of Six are already building content for Stream 10. And Apple 10 is coming soon. Uh, last week, uh, a bunch of us were at Flock, and at Flock we, we had a very fun hack fest to start bootstrapping the content of Appel 10. We already have like 200 or so packages, yeah. I believe. Um, Still not the ones that I care about yet, but we're getting yeah, there. We'll get there. We'll get KDE, Neil. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah, I it's want not, <laughs> we'll uh, It's not shipped yet to the mirrors, to be clear. It is available into some, some repo hidden squirreled away while we make everything work nicely, but it will be there soon. To borrow a torturous phrase from, uh, from Davida, it's basically primordial soup at this point. Yes, yes. 
So we've talked about all this upstream related stuff. Let's talk a little bit about the special interest group stuff, specifically with what we do with the hyperscale SIG. Hyperscale is a special interest group within the CentOS project that focuses on CentOS stream exclusively. The idea is to have a place for everybody that is interested in maintaining large scale deployments, uh, having a place to work together. Uh, we've noticed that over the years, every company that tends to deploy CentOS ends up kind of reinventing the same tools and up hitting the same problems. So we wanted to have a space for people to be able to collaborate. And while a lot of the members here work in large companies, it's by no means limited to large companies. This is Hi, I to, don't. Yes, uh, Neil is the example. This is open to anybody that is interested in working in this space uh, that would like to cooperate on development, on tooling, instead of doing work on their own. Uh, we also like using Hyperscale as kind of a space for prototyping new work in CentOS that then potentially can become its own SIG later on. And we'll have a few examples of that. Um, there is a website. Uh, we have weekly meetings, uh, bi-weekly meetings on Matrix uh, that everybody's welcome to attend. We also do monthly uh, hackathons and like video hangouts because it's nice to see each other face to face once in a while and not just at conferences. Uh, we have started doing meetups from uh, last year, two yeah, years ago. Yeah, last year. We started with CentOS Connect like that. last year. Usually like one or two a year. Um, and that's the matrix room where you can find most of us hanging out. Um, so one of the things we carry in Hyperscale is backports of packages that move faster than what is shipped in CentOS stream itself. Uh, so the idea is that there, if there are packages that we want to follow closely, we usually want to be able to have the latest upstream uh, release instead of having whatever version CentOS stream ships. Because when you do development on a, on, a, on a project upstream, you do development against the upstream project. So you want to be able to integrate the changes quickly and test them. The idea is that the packages we provide here are drop-in replacement for the distro packages. So they should add features and make things better, but they shouldn't make things work. Uh, worse, yeah, ideally. Yeah, they should make things work, but importantly- They, they should not make them worse, yes. yes. But importantly, uh, these are all compatible backports. So the yes. idea is that we try to maintain uh, the the inter the integration with the rest of the distribution, ABI and API stability, but we're bringing back things that are useful for people to like use their computers. Yep. If you if you are running right now a CentOS stream system, you can run the DNF command and that will install a release package that will make this repository available, and then um, you could probably enable vendor pinning unless you want to upgrade everything. Uh, but you can also just cherry pick individual things that you might find useful. Uh, there is a non-exclusive list of things in here, which is also not up to date, but the link is up to date. Um, but generally, this tends to be like either low level system user space and plumbing, or um, I would say developer tooling. So like, for example, the Beam and Emacs are in there because developers like having the very latest version of Beam, And it's, it's kind and of handy Emacs. to have that backported. And Emacs for those who you would use Emacs. Um, or, or things that like members of the SIG have a specific interest in, uh, like systemd, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and there's a bunch of other things that are in progress. Uh, so for systemd specifically, uh, systemd is an actively maintained backport that tracks the latest stable release. So it's 256 right now, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, 256.4, I think, is what we're on right yep. now. And, and this is effectively a straight backport of the Fedora systemd package with all the bells and whistles enabled. So this will ship more sub packages and more features than the one that CentOS stream, stock CentOS stream ships. So this ships a fully functional UMD. It ships NetworkD, it ships ResolveD, it ships all of the ancillary daemons. Um, including the weird ones like HomeD. Yes, including, uh, I don't think we've ever tested that one, so that could be fun. Um, <laughs> this also ships with SE Linux um, enablement. Um, however, it would be great to get feedback on the SE Linux enablement because it's not been super well tested. But it should work, at least I would say for the, the core parts of systemd should work. I would definitely not trust something like HomeD to work Although properly to be with fair, SLAs. I would probably say HomeD is probably not working in Fedora either because yeah. people aren't. Eh. So if you're interested in HomeD stuff and you want to work with us to make it actually work, by all means, come by. Talk yeah, to us. Yeah, that could be fun. Um, this is also the version of systemd that we run in production at Meta everywhere uh, because we do a lot of development upstream on systemd. Uh, so we wanted a way to do this work in the open and not just behind closed doors. Uh, we also have a CI. Uh, we have a continuous infrastructure that every day takes the latest system D git main, rebuilds it, and gives a signal on whether things are going to break. Because again, it's really nice to find out breakage as it happens and not at release time and then everything is broken. Uh, and we have a contribution guide. So oh, yeah. you can, um, well, this is actually surprisingly well documented. Uh, so both how to use it and how to work with it. 
So with the virtualization stack, this was something that I had started a couple yep. releases back, a uh, couple CentOS stream releases back. This is essentially backporting the core parts of the virtualization stack to enable features that have kind of dried up in the Red Hat Enterprise Linux side. Particularly, there's a lot of there's a few members that are interested in things like VDI and having efficient desktop virtualization or like remote virtualization access, which are all features that are not present in Red Hat Enterprise Linux now. Uh, but are still available in the upstream, and so we just backport these things from Fedora and, and re-enable it. Um, uh, and we actually ship this. That's, that's currently in testing, but we actually ship this. Yes, for I nine. think we, we need to actually update the yes. deck to tell us that, because we've been shipping it for like a year now. Yeah, I think so. Um, so this is actually an example of something where we, we mentioned earlier about how we were an incubator to bring in things to, to, another, uh, to create another SIG, and as well as to contribute into the CentOS stream core. Um, Several years back, we had this uh, in, with this effort with Intel to provide um, optimized packages that enable uh, at runtime for CPUs that have support for it, uh, hardware features that improve the performance of essentially core libraries like Zlib, glibc, the whole works. Um, and this was brought in, and we 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 prototyped it and incubated it with a with the hyperscale Intel sub working group thing. Yep. Um, eventually, the interest was caught on, and then people at Red Hat were interested in it and brought it backward into uh, and, and spawned a an instruction set architecture SIG, an ISA SIG that that took on that work and integrated it into into CentOS Stream proper, and that is now fed into CentOS Stream eight and nine, and is also part of ten as well. And that SIG, I believe, is mostly doing this kind of stuff now. So it's a Great example of being able to use hyperscale as a way to onboard new community engagements and contributors, and to support the further development of the enterprise Linux uh, ecosystem. Yep. Um, another example of what we can use the SIG for is sometimes there are packages where we would like to like have a deviation in terms of policy uh, versus what is shipped in CentOS Stream. So one example was with CentOS Linux 8, for example, IP tables only supported uh, NF tables, and we wanted support for the legacy backend. Um, this is actually not a thing that we ship in the SIG anymore because now we can do this through a tell and that's much easier to maintain. Um, but that's, that's an example. The idea here is that these are still meant to be backwards compatible and as small as possible. Uh, but when it's meaningful, we'd like to offer the choice for people to get extra options. I think this uh, a more accurate example is probably our Quemu package because yeah, Kimu is a good one because we do because like that one we have to we turn features back on. Yep that people need and enable sub packages and, and features that are not present in RHEL. Yeah, Kimu is also fairly op opinionated in this packaging stream. So yeah, right. that makes sense. Um, also, we can use the SIG for doing large scale testing. Uh, so I mentioned before the work we're doing on the NF copy on Bright. Um, long story short, this is a way to leverage features of modern file systems such as ButterFS to optimize package installation and packaging workflows. So this, in practice, this makes package installations a lot faster and efficient on the machine. Now, this work requires changing RPM, DNF, and various components of the packaging stack. It's been in development for several years. We've been working with the, with the upstream folks in RPM and DNF in getting it upstreamed, and it's been through several rewrites. It, it will get there eventually, but it I, is I a sizable so. amount of work. I mean, uh, one of the things that made this particularly exciting for me is that, like, so as part of some of the hyperscale stuff that, that we do, is, which we'll talk about in a bit, is that we build images using you know, the Kiwi image build tool and all this other stuff. And we build these images, and the way, because of this enhancement, we have we can make our image builds go from like seven ten minutes to like two, and so being able to go through this super fast because we're able to cache, reuse, use extent uh, extent manipulation to be able to have the images be made like that. It's it really does improve the quality of life for being able to do things at a large scale. Yep, um, and because we would like to deploy this in production and meta among other places, uh, it makes sense to have a place where the whole stack will be available so people can just DNF install. Uh, the release package, and then if you upgrade, the whole stack gets deployed. Um, this works. It is something we are actually running in production. It's also something I happen to run at home. Um, but we do put it in a separate repository because this changes fairly significantly the behavior of components, low-level components in the system. So we didn't want to just unleash this to everyone while it's still in active development. Right. And related to that, right, we also have a, a kernel. Um, currently 6.8. Hopefully soon I will release the 6.10 that I've been working on. It's been a weird going process. We previously <laughs> had our kernel based on the rel kernel with doing contributions to the to the rel kernel to enable uh, to, to have code backports and stuff like that. As we started needing new features and more improvements, it became too difficult for us to do that, so we rebased to following the Fedora kernel. 
and we have a kernel that has, you know, we build for CentOS Stream 9. Soon we will have CentOS Stream 10 once the quirks that I've been discovering get fixed. Um, we have Butterfest support and notably also Binderfest support. There was a few people who were interested in being able to do Android development from, uh, from a CentOS Stream machine uh, because they want a long-term stable platform to be able to do all this stuff and, and Android development is a pain in the butt on anything. And so being able to do it like once instead of like every few times, win. So we turn that on. And we, the main thing that keeps this as experimental is that we don't have secure boot enablement. There's a ticket open. We'll hopefully someday have that. But otherwise, it's a pretty solid process uh, and, a, and a solid uh, experience uh, from what people tell yep. me. Um, so again, I mentioned that we used to be based on the 5.14 kernel for CentOS Stream 9. Um, this was, as we were doing that, we worked with the, the RHEL kernel developers to you know, backport and improve features, uh, fix bugs and stuff like that, and also to make it easier for um, uh, if you, you know, the KMod SIG, which does a lot of building kernel modules for the RHEL kernel that are not turned on in the RHEL kernel itself. Uh, we helped enable them, things like having ButterFS on, on stock CentOS Stream 9 and also for RHEL 9 itself, and that was part of that. And as, again, related to that, I need to update that link, that link is wrong. <laughs> um, the, we have a contribution guide to help yes. people um, contribute to the RHEL kernel in a way that makes the RHEL kernel engineers not cry, which is uh, important. <laughs> Uh, people crying from receiving contributions that don't make sense, not okay. But uh, so we, we, we work very hard to try to make sure that we have a good process for enabling people to be successful engaging with the various aspects of the core CentOS stream community. Uh, on the user space side, we backport various parts of the user space that's needed to enable ButterFS support. Um, we also uh, ship a version of KPatch um, that is actually useful if you want to build your own patches. KPatch as it shipped in CentOS stream and in Red is nerfed in that you can't build patches, you can just use patches that you get from Red Hat, I assume. Yeah. Um, but it's useful to be able to build your own patches if you happen to lifecycle your own kernels, so we are throwing that support. And we also backported um, support for PGO optimizations and for Clang built kernels. Um, we are short on time. Um, we have containers. We have containers. We have a container image that you can play with. The automation to build these containers is currently broken, but we will get there eventually. If someone we're, we're, here really likes OpenShift and wants to help us fix it, that is appreciated. We would like to rework this so that we have something working for CentOS Stream 10, which we're trying to launch that soonish. Um, we have the live media stuff. Remember, we talked about all these other pieces of the things. The, uh, we have the, the hyperscale spin, and the live media is the main output of that so far. There'll be more things. We have cloud images that are being worked on. I didn't put it in the slide deck, ran out of time, but they're all there. This essentially <laughs> lets you try everything that we're working on all at once. The virtualization's integrated, the systemd is integrated, the RPM cow stuff is done, ButterFS is on by default, we have all the, the Z standard compression, all the other features. We pull in essentially the latest that we got from Fedora that we've contributed to, bring it into CentOS Stream and package it up in a way that you can use it like that. And with that, let's talk about how you can also get involved. As we mentioned, CentOS as a project, uh, there's a blog that you're welcome to read. There's a mailing list where most of the project discussions happen. Most of the SIGs within CentOS have open meetings. Uh, there's a community calendar that you can join. You can join any meeting and any SIG. Uh, people are generally very happy to have folks engage and ask questions and be involved. Uh, you can join a SIG or you can start a SIG if you would like. Uh, you can report or fix bugs. Uh, unfortunately, you have to use Jira if it's on the CentOS frame side, but eh. Whatever. Um, you can maintain packages in Fedora or in Appel, and you can contribute to Fedora directly. Uh, there's a really good article in the Fedora magazine about that. Uh, and finally, uh, we give a lot of talks uh, that cover all of the things we talked about in detail, and you can like find this one. the list there. Uh, I believe that's all we had, and there is time for questions. Um, so maybe this is something that I'm just a little unaware of, but um, since you're talking about a lot of what you're doing is pulling in stuff that is been put in and working in Fedora and trying to get that to work with CentOS Stream, I'm like, what is the difference between the stuff, the uh, the packages that you that can get pulled from enabling the CentOS hyperscaler release stuff versus like having the package in like Apple? So <laughs> usually the we. If we can do something in Apple, we prefer doing it in Apple because it's a lot easier for everyone and it's more widely useful because packages in Apple are also useful for folks running Red Hat Linux straight up. Um, but sometimes when, if you need to replace a core system package like systemd, you can't have packages in Apple that are overlapping with packages that are already shipped in CentOS Stream. Hence the extra packages part. Yeah, so for those, we ship those in the SIG. 
Right. And if there's something where like it could be an Apple, but it is basically useless without some enablement yeah. that we do in the core package set, we mostly try to avoid putting it in Apple because we, we're not putting packages that are useless. Yeah. One thing we started doing a bit more is try to use Apple for uh, sub packages. So sometimes what happens is that Red Hat will carve out some of the sub packages of a package that they ship in CentOS Stream and URL. Um, but the sub packages are still useful and they still work. They just add additional stuff. And if we can maintain those in Appel, again, it's less work for everyone. So we try to do that. That requires a bit of like finagling, but um, the workflow is still not fantastic, but it's getting there. Uh, there was another question, I believe. Yeah, who's more people. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was really cool. Um, it, early in the talk, you mentioned uh, the continuous build nature of, of how these images are created or how the, the output is created. Does that also imply that there's like a continuous testing that's happening or is that on like a per yes. project basis or how does that work? So there is testing on all of the steps. Uh, so Fedora does its own testing and integration, uh, both on a per package basis for packages that have their own testing at compose level with gating and with OpenQA. CentOS Stream has uh, gating on every MR. So whenever there, all the changes that flow in Stream flow through a merge request and on every MR there's tests that are per package and then there's also distribution level testing. And then also Red Hat has actually humans that perform QA on, on it. Um, and then RHEL, I assume, does its own internally, but I don't work for Red Hat, so I don't have visibility in that. But I would assume Red Hat that both has automated and human QA for their product that they sell. Right. So if you want to think about it this way, Fedora has, um, machine, uh, has uh, functional testing and HCI testing. Then you have CentOS Stream that does integration testing. Uh, and then you have uh, RHEL that does uh, um, uh, uh, product testing. So, yep. the, like, so the, those are the different layers here. And, and they, they don't just go straight downward, they kind of also go up. So you tend to see things flow in both directions and it, it's like a puddle with ripples. That's the um, best I can go with. I, I will point out that there is a special interest group within CentOS that works exactly on this. It's the integration SIG. There's documentation there that I don't know if I can pull up because I don't know if internet works, but that there's a I diagram that I explains how it. the flow works very well. Um, and there's also work going on in making the tests that are um, that used to be behind the RHEL firewall, so to speak, more widely available so that people can contribute to them. And that's all actually going all the way up to Fedora then being branched into CentOS automatically. So yep. a lot of the Red Hat testing work is being pushed back up to Fedora for yeah. maximal benefit. Very cool, thank you. Thanks for the talk, very informative, <coughs> sorry. Is there any work uh, around CV tracking for the SIGs for EPAL, for CentOS Stream, because the other day I was checking Red Hat's Bugzilla, and there were thousands of EPAL tickets, EPAL CV tickets, um, until EPAL 8 or so. Now, that it, there are none. So I is there any work in that area? Because so I think that's one of the things that prevents people from using it in production. There are different levels to this question. I believe there is CV tracking for EPAL, There's actually. CV tracking for all of the Fedora project, which includes extra packages, yeah. but here's the thing. With the exception of the product Red Hat Enterprise Linux, no one is actually paid to do security work. So if security work is something that you care about, this is a point of contribution rather than a point of uh, derision. Um, so like, I'm serious, right? Like you, you can't expect people who, are not, who, who don't have the bandwidth or the time or the wherewithal to be able to pull that stuff off. Um, now, speaking about the special interest groups, SIGs can opt into this process uh, as they so please. For example, we recently joined, the Hyperscale SIG recently joined um, some, some of the groups that are needed for doing CVE tracking on select components that yep. we maintain. Um, and that sort of thing can happen, and it does when, when teams opt into it. But in general, I would say that you can, you can see CV reporting being relatively consistent, but depending on who is able to work on it and what kind of time and skill that they have, it kind of depends. If you care about this kind of stuff, this is a point where you can come in and help. And, and that's what I would encourage people to do. Michelle. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Michelle. Like, um, I'm like, um, involved in like, uh, getting hyperscale into the Linux distribution um, security embargo list. Um, but yeah, like, um, uh, in the Apple like, uh, steering committee, we did look at, like, uh, there was an effort a couple of years ago to start driving down CVEs. A lot of the problem is that, um, especially for older app release like uh, EL7, uh, because we cannot ship incompatible upgrades. You kind of like, well, this is a bug. 
it's also a really old package and like uh, you really shouldn't be using it. We do have a policy for like, um, you know, like you, you can retire old packages on the ground of security issues and ship replaces the new packages. So yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing effort and we welcome any help. S a lot of the problems sometimes that uh, packages get branched for Apple and then not really maintained because people just branch it for dependencies. Yeah, so yeah. And, and again, this also comes back to, you know, you, there's a special level of skill required to be able to do security fixes on releases, on versions of software that are not changing. This is a real specialty that Red Hat provides as an offering and a service with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Community folks, the skill levels go all the way around, and it kind of depends whether or not they're capable of it. So it's hard. All right, we are out of time. Thank you, everyone.